Heavenly Father, we gather today to reflect on mechanisms, dispositions, the spirit required, the graces we require to make marital relationships work today. Grant your graces to the married, married couples here and those who are participating online. Grant to aspiring and intending couples your grace to understand your design for the institution of the family and marriage. Grant your children the grace to live out perfectly your design. We are in crisis today, Lord, but by your help, we know that things can be turned around. Let this forum yield fruit in turning around, at least for some, the situation of marriage in our country and in the world. At the end of this exercise, help to heal the wounds in many of our families. Help to heal the wounds between many husbands and wives. Bring peace to troubled hearts and troubled homes. Saint Joseph the worker, pray for us. Saint Joseph, foster father of Jesus, pray for us. Saint Joseph, leader of the household of Christ, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Marital relationships as designed by God. Marital relationships as corrupted by sin. And marital relationships as redeemed in Christ Jesus. God designed marital relationships in a particular way. And we see it all over the scriptures. Fallen humanity corrupted marital relationships. As we also see in the scriptures and as we see happening around us. But Jesus Christ came and redeemed humanity. And among the dimensions of the human story and human existence that Jesus redeemed is marital relationships. If you look at Genesis chapter one, chapter two, we have two versions of the creation story. Chapter two, verse eighteen to twenty-five. Chapter two, verse eighteen to twenty-five, tell us how God saw that the man was alone. And he said, let us make a helpmate for him. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The rib of the Lord and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The man then exclaimed, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one 
shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Then the critical verse, verse 24, Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is the same text that Jesus quoted uh, in Matthew chapter 19. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The second chapter of Genesis, verse 18 to 25. Now, in Luke's gospel, chapter 1, sorry, Luke's gospel, chapter 1, verse 26, we see the story of the Holy Family. The holy disposition, the obedience, the humility displayed by both Joseph and Mary. Obedience to God, respect, care, consideration for the spouse, sacrifice, the sense of sacrifice displayed by St. Joseph, foster father of Jesus. Please take time to read that passage. And I have already referred to this passage of Matthew chapter 19. When the Pharisees came to Jesus to ask about divorce. From verse 3. Some Pharisees came to him, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother? And be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. They then said to him, Why then did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her? He said to them, It was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. His disciples then said, if such is the case of a man with his wife, then it is better not to marry. But he said to them, please take note. Verse, he said to them, verse 11, not everyone can accept this teaching. Not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. And I link that statement of Matthew chapter 19, verse 11, I link it to John chapter 6, verse 69. When Jesus Christ had preached his toughest sermon about eating his body and drinking his blood, I am the bread of life. We were told that the many, the 5,000 people who had eaten to their field and who were following him about, they disappeared one after the other. And they said this was a hard saying. We can't accept this teaching. They went away, one by one, until Jesus looked and he was left with only the 12 disciples. And he turned to them and said, what about you? Do you want to go away too? Meaning, you are free to go away. This is something that I would like to emphasize because we are in a, in a country and in a, at a time where people think that Christianity is about numbers. 
mass Christianity, I have constantly said here, mass Christianity will not survive in the new century. Mass Christianity. If you come from a place where everybody is a Christian, chances are that nobody is a Christian. I hold this and I have good grounds for holding it. You come from a place where everybody says we are Christian, look closely. You may discover that no one is really a serious Christian. Cultural Christianity will not survive in the 21st century. It was Bernard Lonergan, a Canadian philosopher, theologian, who had said some 40 years ago that in the, in the next century, Christianity will only survive in its sectarian form, in small, small cells. The kind of cells I have been talking about here to say we have a covenant community of a close-knit people who support themselves to live the Christian life. But if everybody in the house is getting up to go to church and everybody in town is a, is a Christian, chances are that it's a cultural Christianity. Such Christianity is not strong and will not survive will not survive the challenges of the new century. I am convinced about this. So Jesus Christ says, what about you? Do you want to go away too? Meaning, I won't force you to follow me. I can't force you and I will not force you. When God created you, one of the great gifts God gave to you is freedom of choice. So I will not force you. Do you want to go away too? And Peter gave that famous answer. To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the word of life. To whom shall we go? We believe, yes, we know. You are the son of God. And I constantly tell people that when Peter made this declaration, to whom shall we go? We know that you have the word of life. That he made this statement not with a very strong, deep sense of acceptance. It's almost like, well, yeah, what you have said is really hard. Oh, I agree with those who have gone. That what you have said is really hard, but with, with what I have seen of you, where else? I'm stuck with you. That, that appears to me to be the disposition behind that song, that, uh, those words. I'm stuck with you. And to show that Peter was not that strong in his conviction, you see what happened sometime after. When his life was to be at risk, he chickened out. So, when Jesus says in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 19, not all can accept this teaching. Only those to whom it is given. I normally ask people, do you consider yourself one of those to whom it is given? If you find the standards of Christian marriage too high for you, maybe you are not one of those to whom it is given. Maybe you are one of those in the world who cannot live the, Christian, the standards of the Christian marriage. Because Christian marriage de demands grace. Christian marriage is for Christians. I want you to know that the sacrament of matrimony is for Christians. When a Christian, or when two non-Christians marry. It is not a sacrament. I do see people send cards who are not Christians send cards and say matrimony. Have you seen that before? They, are, they, are, they want to do mat That's not Matrimony is a sacrament. If you are not a Christian, you don't celebrate a sacrament. Also, if a Muslim marries a Christian, is it a sacrament? And do the marriage in church, is it a sacrament? No. No, because you need the two for the sacrament to happen. When a Muslim marries a Christian, the marriage is blessed, but it is not a sacrament. When two Christians, two baptized persons come in marital union, a sacrament occurs. That means 
that apart from God being present with the man and being present with the woman, God is coming to be present with the two in a very special manner. So, when in the Christian standard, we are going to see things like abide in me, John chapter 15, verse 1 to 10. Abide in me and let my word abide in you. It is only when you abide in me and allow my word to abide in you and you keep my commandments that you will bear much fruit. For cut off from me, you can do nothing. It is only those who have embraced Jesus and the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus and the values of Jesus, they are the ones who can understand such a statement. We are going to discuss that a lot of the turbulence we have in marriage all over the place today is on account of the fact that few people are indeed abiding in Christ. Do you understand me? Many people are going to church, but few people truly abide in Christ. No wonder they cannot live the standards of Christian marriage. Christian marriage is a calling and accompanying that calling, there is grace. But if you do not accept the calling, if you reject the calling in several ways by, by the choices you make, by the kind of company you keep, by the, your kind of preoccupation, if you reject that calling, then don't be surprised if you do not have what it takes to live through that life. John chapter 15, we have talked of verse 1 to 10. Verse, verse um, 1 to 10 is where he talks of ab abiding in me. And verse 11 to 13, he says that, keep my commandments if you love me. There is no greater love than for a man to do what? To lay down his life for his friends. Verse, 5, verse 5, uh, 13, chapter 15, verse 13. There is no greater love. So, all those, some of you here and those who are watching us, I love you, I love you, I love you. <laughs> In many cases, the people are not ready for any inconvenience not to talk of dying for the person they say they love. And it is becoming more and more far-fetched today. True, genuine love the kind of love that is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 to 13, it is becoming perfect. Love is kind. Love is patience. Love is, I mean, love does not rejoice in another person's uh, um, um, fall. All those. You look at it. We read it at weddings and so on and so forth. But people just read it and drop it. The import of that reading which describes what love is and what Christian love is. Many people cannot. And, and I'm going to talk about it because many people are not able to really understand, not to talk of practicing it, unfortunately because from childhood they have never experienced such love. From childhood what they see with their parents is not an example of that kind of love. And as they grow up, they don't have many such examples. So, what they know is that, you know, in our interpersonal relationships, it is about either mutual or unilateral um, exploitation. You exploit me, I exploit you. If you can exploit me 50% and I exploit you 50%, good for us. But if I see you exploiting me 55% and me only 45%, then I shout. Is that love? Absolutely. It's game, game playing. Human beings are just playing game and doing business and business enterprises. For a number of people, their marriage is only a contract. And I hope Dr. Uh, uh, Julius Bala will be able to t talk to us because if it is contract, then it's more of a matter of rights. Rights of the contractual partners. And for many people, that is very serious. Yeah. My right. My right. Somebody came to me, Father. Father, she denied me of my marital right. She denied me of my marital right. 
See, you are talking of another person's body. I hope you know. It's not just about right. right if it is about right, go to court and do court wedding. And it's about rights. But if you do church marriage, it's beyond rights. It's a sacrament, a holy union. And it's actually a holy union that calls you to unilateral sacrifice. Meaning, you make sacrifice even if your spouse is not making similar sacrifice. You make the sacrifice because you are called to sacrifice as a Christian, to sacrificial love, irrespective of whether the person reciprocates or not. Is that not our calling? When Jesus Christ says, love your neighbor, did he say, as your neighbor loves you? Is that what Jesus taught? Love your neighbor as I have loved you. So your relationship with your first neighbor, and your spouse is supposed to be your first neighbor, right? Your relationship with your first neighbor is supposed to be dictated by the love of Christ that you have experienced. Next is Ephesians chapter 5. One of the most powerful teachings, Christian teachings about love and marital relationships is found in Ephesians chapter 5. But also one of the most controversial is found in the same passage. Chapter 5, from verse 1 to 16, it tells us about the distinct character of the Christian life, which is the background for what he now later said about marriage. He says, I'll just read sections of that. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God as beloved children. And live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Every time in our Christian faith we talk of loving, it is loving as Christ, not as your wife has loved you or as your husband has loved you. Your wife is not the model of Christian love. Your husband is not the model of Christian love. Who is the model of Christian love? Jesus Christ is as I have loved you, meaning Jesus. But fornication and impurity of any kind or greed must not even be mentioned among you as is proper among saints. Entirely out of place is obscene, silly, and vulgar talk. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Be sure of this, that no fornicator or impure person or one who is greedy, that is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be associated with them. For once you were darkness, but now in the Lord Jesus, you are light. Live, therefore, as children of light. For the fruits of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes light, becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will rise, shine on you. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise people, making the most of the times because the days are evil. The days are what? Evil. Therefore, you must be careful not to be corrupted by the days that are evil. So, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 21. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Can we say that together? Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. We spent a whole session here in this church dealing with uh, this passage of submission. 
in this country, the majority of men, Christian men, they know verse 22, but they don't know verse 21. Verse 22 says, wives, be subject to your husband as you are to the Lord. But that is a passage subsumed under a section that begins with, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. What's the difference? Be su submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Wives, submit your, to your husband as to the Lord. What's the difference? The majority of men know this verse 22, but they don't know verse 21. And verse 21 is the key to marital relationships. Submit to one another as you submit to the Lord. That's the key to Christian marital ethics, Christian marital life. That's the key. You read the rest of that passage, and it compares Jesus Christ, compares a husband to Jesus. So, he says, wife, submit to your husband. And says, husband, love your wives as Christ loves his church and sacrifice himself, making himself a sacrificial offering and died for his church. Eh? Are you able to be that for your wife? I know an American um, uh, professor who says, if I see any man who is ready to do 5% of what Jesus did for the cross, for, for, the, for humanity, for his church, I'm ready to rule on the ground for that man. Uh, are you getting the point? If I see a man who is ready to do 5 10% of what Jesus did for his church, then I am ready to roll on the ground for that man. What it means is that what Jesus did for his church that St. Paul is telling husband to do for their wives, all husbands here should say, ah, this one is hard. Though, if, we are, if we are sincere with ourselves. The absence of of quality marital relationships is a more deadly disease and it is killing more people today than perhaps coronavirus or HIV AIDS or Ebola. The absence of quality marital relationships. In our psychotrauma healing program, we work on the relationship between the, the mind and the body. And the fact that when the mind is not doing well, when there is stress, when there is conflict, when especially the person you are closest to, the person you wake up and see, and see before you go to bed, when you don't have a good relationship with that person, you are a dead person. We are just waiting to bury you. The absence of quality marital relationships is killing people, kills people more than cancer, more than uh, coronavirus. And many people don't recognize it. In fact, a lot of scientific work has been done to demonstrate that connectedness, and we have mentioned here before, connectedness is what makes people live long and healthy. Connectedness. So if you have in the various estates that many of you live, if you have a person in the estate who wakes up every morning and goes from house to house to greet people, who knows the name of the neighbor's children, who, who goes and gathers people, who is very active in the as uh, uh, association of the estate, and so on and so forth, who has a good relationship with his neighbors and his wife and so on, such a person is likely to live healthy, long life. It has been demonstrated that more than good food, more than healthy food, more than organic food, more than not drinking alcohol, not drinking, uh, not smoking, and so on and so forth. More than uh, avoiding pollution, that the most powerful ingredient factor that helps with health, long healthy living, is 
connectedness. What is your relationship with your closest neighbors? And who is the closest neighbor of a married man? Who is the closest neighbor of a, mar of a married woman? If that relationship is toxic, if that relationship is polluted, if that relationship is corrupted, if that relationship is tensed, then all kinds of diseases and illnesses will set in eventually. If it has not started, it is on the way. This is not a cause. It's just the reality. My sister is not here, the endocrinologist. But many of us understand the relationship between tension and stress and internal conflict and the lack of um, conviviality with your, with your neighbor or colleagues and the onset of all kinds of diseases because of the work of the adrenal gland. When you, when you are tensed up, what happens? Your system begins to secrete certain glands, certain um, adrenaline, um, uh, and all kinds of uh, stress hormones. Those stress hormones are not supposed to be allowed to be high for a long time. If they are allowed to be high for a long time, they cause damage to everything. Everything in the system, they cause damage. And then you begin to fall into one e big illness or the other. So, scientists are beginning to discover, medical researchers are beginning to discover that no, we have been putting too much emphasis on curative medicine. We have been putting too much emphasis on drugs. Perhaps we should put some more emphasis on people living uh, with love and unity among one another, especially closest neighbors. Who do you see when you wake up each morning? Who is the first person you see? Is it, it, do you smile at the person? Or there is a, a hangover of yesterday's quarrel and you begin your day with a frown? And when you begin your day with a frown, chances are that that day doesn't end too well. So scientists are beginning to discover this now, that the absence of quality relationships is more deadly than coronavirus. Now, we're going to have to go on a short, um, uh, short break, I mean, group discussion after this. If what we have read is God's design, what we have read in the book of Genesis, if it is God's design for us, if what we have read in Matthew, after the fall, Jesus Christ says, look, uh, Moses allowed you to give a certificate of divorce because of your hardness of heart. Another scripture passage say, uh, translation says, because you are so unteachable, right? Because you are so unteachable. So he allowed you to divorce your wife. And I hope you know, have the, you know the background to that. Moses actually improved the situation. Before then, as you have it in some other uh, cultures and religions, the man will say, how do the Muslims say it? I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you three times, Abi, and you stand divorced. And the man refuses to give you a dismissal paper. And if he doesn't give you a dismissal paper, you can't get married by anybody. That was the situation. The man unilaterally decides to give you, uh, to, to, to divorce you for any reason. Maybe he comes home and the soup you gave him has too much salt. And then you ask, you ask her to go, and then you don't give her a writ of dismissal. If you don't give a writ of dismissal, a certificate of dismissal, it means legally she is still your wife. Even though you have chased her away, then she is stranded because she can't marry another person. So what Moses did is to say, uh -uh, let us be a little more humane now. So Moses said, yes, you can send your wife away, but I beg, give her a writ of dismissal. Now, they now use it and say, but Moses allowed us to suck our wives. And Jesus says, it is because of your hardness of heart. 
I mean, when the same hardness of heart that led the Jews in the desert to call Aaron and forced Aaron to make a molten image for them, isn't it? Most, Aaron made molten image for them now. So if they went and told uh, uh, Moses that eh, it is your brother Aaron that made molten image, Moses would have answered, it is because of your hardness of heart. Then Jesus says, but from the beginning, it wasn't meant to be so. From the beginning, it was not meant to be so. This is not how God made it. Have you not read that the one who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. If this is how God desired it, sin spoiled it. Jesus came and elevated the union of man, the natural union of man and woman to the level of what? A sacrament, as St. Paul explained so well to us. Why the widespread marital crisis and conflict? Why the marital toxicity and dysfunction widespread? I mean, in this chapel, this small chapel, I mean, we are overwhelmed. Overwhelmed with conflicts. And all over, uh, innocent. They keep, they keep calling me from, from your place, my former parish, saying that, oh, Father, it is you alone my wife will listen to. It is you alone my husband will listen to. I say, we people have a priest. Let him learn to listen to another person. It's just, it's just overwhelming. And I look at it, once they begin to talk, first five minutes of their talking, or one of them talking, I, I know that... What is happening is that there is no, what I will explain to you, there's no transcendent thought. The God factor is not there. They are doing human negotiations. And we are a fallen human nature. We are, humanity is falling. If the God dimension and the Christ dimension is not there, it is either bilateral exploitation, you exploit me, and I exploit you, God, no go vex. Or unilateral exploitation, meaning if I can get away with it and exploit you as much as possible. Without the God factor, without the supernatural factor, without the commitment to the fundamentals of Christian marriage, it is a battleground. Why? As I will explain later. This is humanity. This is how human beings are. We are a fallen human nature. We cheat one another. We kill one another. We abuse one another. We exploit one another. That is human nature. The one who has come to make a difference is who? Jesus Christ. And Jesus who has come to make a difference says, I say to you, on account of your hardness of heart, Jesus, uh, Moses allowed you to do this, but I say this to you. So I always tell couples that, listen, if you don't have a prior commitment to Jesus Christ and a serious one, please don't bother me about your marriage. Go and see secular marriage counselors. Don't bother me about your marriage because I am going to be using what principles? Christian principles. I'm going to be using Christian principles. Why is marital relationship today among many people so toxic, so dysfunctional? By dysfunctional, I mean, first of all, by toxic. You know what toxins are? You know, otapiapia kind of thing. A poison. Otapiapia. Some marital relationships are not different from 
Otape apia. Meaning, children growing up are exposed to poison. Just watching their father and their mother, they are being destroyed. Just like Otape apia destroys rats. Dysfunctional. Many husbands and, 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 and wives are living together. What do man go do? They are living together, but it is, the relationship is not functional. They are living together, as Yoruba say, in Turi and Womo, because of children. In a male chauvinist society, where in large measure, a man has a child of five and another of three and chases the wife away and, has, and tells the Norway school not to allow the, man, the, the woman to show up there. I hope you know that is happening. Tells the nursery school not to allow the, man, the woman to show up there. Tells the whatever. At the end of the day, the children are stranded. Those are completely broken down ones. But there are dysfunctional ones that are not broken down. There, are, there is much spousal abuse, spousal contempt. I mean, the kind of things I have heard with, with this my year. I wish you can anoint, deliver, do deliver, deliverance for my year. For the kind of things that spouses have said about one another. Things I never imagined I would hear in my life. Things that should not be said. I mean, somebody comes and tells me about the wife. This afternoon, after this at 3 o'clock, we are going to do a wedding. And then you hear all the uh, wonderful things they will say about one another at the reception and so on and so forth. And then three months after, three years after, you hear them talk about one another. You can't believe yourself. Can't you, for the sake of the crowd that we are gathered on your wedding day, can't you reserve some of these things? Can't you, for the sake of the promise you made, for better, for worse? I mean, I tell people, we say, no, not that one, Father. Not that one. You made a for better, for worse. So your husband did this. Well, unfortunately, that's part of the for worse. He said, Father, it doesn't include that one. And that makes me very, very slow to get involved in any marriage. And you see, we do only about one marriage a year here. Right? About one. Okay, we're going to have two or so this year. Because I am very slow. I'm very, very slow because I know that maybe 75% of people who are coming up to marry in any church today are not prepared. Innocent, right? They are not prepared. And if I have my way, I will subject people to one year of formation before marriage. Unfortunately, they are finding it so easy to walk in and within one month they are doing marriage only for the thing to be crashing. Then there is wife battering. Even though some women are beginning to try their best in that area. Then there is a very high rate of divorce. What was that figure we were given in February that in Abuja Oh, last year, right? Was it this year? Uh, 4,000 divorce applications in two months. No, divorce application to the family courts in Abuja. 4,000 in two months. Huh? You are surprised. I don't know how many marriages, weddings we had in those two months, but in two months alone. Statistics show, uh, some, somebody who has done, uh, his name will come up, John Gottman and others, have, who have done a lot of research on marriage, have shown that in America today, 52% of marriages are collapsing within the first five years. And, you know, they have a lot of living together, people who live in. Those ones are 70%. Of course, those ones who are living together, they can be 100% because they are just living in, they are doing trial. If you, do, if you use your marriage as trial, it will collapse. <laughs> 
They say, if you leave the back door open, you will surely use it. Can we say that together? If you use, leave the back door open, then you will surely use it. You are either all in it, or there is no marriage. Jordan Peterson, the famous Canadian psychologist, says that. That you are, the game of marriage is such that you are either all in, or you have no marriage. Because if you leave the back door open, you will use it. Let me leave it at this and request that the men go to the hall and discuss for the next 15 minutes and the women stay here and discuss for the next 15 minutes why the widespread marital conflicts and crisis, marital toxicity and dysfunction, spousal abuse and contempt and battering, high rate of marital breakdown and divorce, why among Christians who are committed to the values or who are supposed to be committed to the values we read out earlier? Why, therefore, these challenges? Let the men go to the hall. Let the women stay here and discuss for 15 minutes. And then uh, let there be a report. Somebody to report for the women. Somebody to report for the men. Be careful. Let the report from the women not just blame men for everything. Because you, you, you won't be sincere with yourself. Let the report from the men not just blame women for everything because you won't be sincere with yourself. So do a realistic discussion for only 15 minutes and then come, there will be a three minutes uh, each report from uh, each person. Just bullet points that the report will be. Why do you think, do you, does your group believe that there is all this problem now? Okay, so we go for uh, a break. Fly to thy patronage. O Holy Mother of God, despise not our prayers and our necessities, for deliver us from all dangers, ever glorious and blessed Virgin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, good afternoon, all. From the men's group, we have, I can see, almost for the numerous points that our Father gave us, uh, the reasons why we have the widespread marital crisis and conflict and the rest, we have almost like 28 points. First, financial stress, financial stress, social changes, uh, social changes in the society. Um, we have upbringing. People have remained, men and women have remained boys and girls because of the upbringing. Uh, lack of humility, that is pride in the family. Poor communication, the lack of the God factor, fear of God in marriage. Cultural and traditional practices and influences, parental influences on marriage, and then increasing loss of sense of community that people are not seeing together, that role models are disappearing from the society. There are no role models that people can learn from. Lack of appreciation of family values and clear definition of roles and responsibilities in marriage. We talked about the social, the influence of social media. And we talked about the God factor, the absence of Christ in marriage. And then the advent of feminism as relates to humanism. Bringing a set, a mindset into marriage, lack of going to God for renewal and restoration. Uh, we talked about the greed, selfishness, and avarice in marriage. And then somebody talked about the open door that was left behind. If you left an open door in the marriage, that is, again, people will, like Father said, people will almost always take that back door out of marriage. We talked about secularism and foreign influences, suspicion. The reasons are many, but I think I'll just leave it at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, it's useful. Put your papers uh, there. It's useful. Now, the women. Um, so for the women, we talked about why we have the widespread marital conflicts that lead to divorce and so many other dysfunctions in the marriage. And we came to a lot of points, and one was financial conflicts. We have lack of commitment to the marriage in the first place. We have lack of freedom in the marriage. We have that's a cautious heart. We have lack of effective communication in terms of finances, the roles which each partner is supposed to play. 
we have the lack of Christian foundation of sacrifice and forgiveness, as well as the God factor that's families praying together. Then we have comparisons. When couples tend to compare their own husbands or their wives with others or their marriages with others. Then we also have cliques where we where in the sense of the types of friends that you associate with. There's also lack of contentment. There's external influences from friends and family. There's pressure from family and society for singles to get married without being adequately prepared, not knowing their capabilities or incapabilities. And then keeping secrets from one another, not taking your spouse as your best friend. Then there's lack of respect, which comes sometimes from maybe a, a particular partner or a particular spouse being more financially independent than the other. Then we have pride, which causes conflict that lasts longer than it is supposed to be. And then um, there's distance. We talked about distance, where one spouse is in another location and another spouse is in another location. We also talked about ill health of children or spouses. It could also lead to conflict. Then we have um, cultural practices. In the cultural practices, we looked at where a woman has to take permission from her husband before taking care of her family, and then it doesn't go both ways. And then also gender, especially in the Igbo culture, where a family has mainly girls, the husband's family, they are ready to find the man another wife to give him boys. Then we ended it with, um, at this time that women are feeling more um, financially independent, they feel that there's no need for the marriage anymore and then it can lead to the high rate of marital breakdown and divorce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank God that nobody came and just blamed the other, right? I think it was a fairly balanced report. Okay. Um, before coming here, I outlined some of what um, I believe are possible causes of marital dysfunction. Um, before some of you, I have to preempt you, before some of you say, what do I know about marriage since I'm not married? I have constantly told people that I was not born in the sacristy and I was not raised in the sanctuary. I was born in a normal home. And I grew up in a normal home. And for the past nearly 40 years, I have been relating with, closely with couples and dealing with issues of marital conflict. So I do have, and, 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 and especially for those who will think that I'm done by, I don't know, actually they say, the more you look, the less you see. You need to be distant from certain things to see it well. And when it comes to marriage, my distance from marriage, from point of view of personal uh, engagement in marriage, has helped me to see certain things in marriage perhaps better than those of you who are inside. I'm saying certain things. So, my first point <clears throat> about the cause of marital dysfunction is the fallen human nature. Human beings are fallen. Saint, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Saint Paul says, "All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God." All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is the reality. Now we all say it. Now you all chorus it with me. But when you begin to react to your husband's fallen nature, when he reacts to your wife's fallen nature, uh, fallen nature, you forget the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We often make demands of our neighbor in a manner that we appear to forget this fallen nature. And it is standard among human beings that we often excuse ourselves of our faults, but we don't so excuse our neighbor of their faults. 
I have discussed here, and it is usually part of my homilies at weddings, Ellen the button statement that we are all a little bit crazy. So all the marital problems that you know, that you hear of, that you see, they are a manifestation of the madness of each individual. They are a manifestation of the fact that each individual is a little bit crazy. And I do say at weddings that Ellen the button says in his book, The Cause of Love, that it is desirable that when people meet and are attracted to one another to marry, that the first question they should ask themselves is, in what manner are you crazy? In my own case, I am crazy in this way, in that way, in that way. In what manner is your own madness? I take it that we, each one of us is mad in our own way. In what way is your own madness expressed? Me, I have known that I do express my madness in this way, that way. He says it would help a lot. That illusion to go around saying that, oh, especially in those days during, uh, I don't know whether they still do it on NTA, after 9 o'clock news on Sunday, then they now show one big man's son or daughter after the other, uh, their weddings. You remember that? And then they will interview the woman, say, what do you think of this person you have married? She said, oh, he's the best man in the world. Now nah, lie. He's the best woman in the world. Now nah, lie. He is the one you have chosen. Tomorrow you will see a better person. But he's the one you have chosen. You have made a commitment to this one. It's not because he's the best man in the world. Right? You see, Ellen the Button says, it is those illusions, the illusion that I have gotten the best three months after, one year after, it leads to what? Frustration. Because you are lying to yourself. We are all broken. How is it that you expect your neighbor to be fully fixed? But we are all broken. And we need a lot of patience with one another. Number two, the restlessness of godlessness. What came out in both the report of the men and the women as the absence of the God factor. St. Augustine says, the Lord has created us for himself and our hearts are restless until they rest in him. As long as we are not hooked to God, as we read in our reading John chapter 15 verse 1 to 10 that we referred to earlier, abide in me and let my word abide in you. A branch cannot bear fruit unless it is part of the vine, neither can you unless you are part of me. So, to the extent that we don't take seriously the God factor, to the extent that the God factor is not the fertilizer of our life, it's not the one that is the source, it's not the one that is the foundation, we are going to crash. St. Augustine understood that very clearly. The Lord has created us for himself and our hearts will remain restless. What does it mean for the heart to remain? A restless heart, can such a person have a peaceful home? So if the wife's heart is restless and the husband's heart is restless, what do you expect? It's a turbulent home. It came out in the report of the men, it came out in the report of the women, the absence of the God factor. And I heard the women, when they were discussing, I heard one old lady say that if people pray, and not just recite prayer, but actually pray. And the husband and wife pray together as husband, Christian husband and wife. And you know that tomorrow morning you are going to pray. Tonight you are going to pray. You would do whatever is needed to, to kind of resolve, manage your conflicts. Because you are supposed to be praying as one with one voice. I call it the widespread neglect of the transcendent third. I thought we would have the time, but we don't have the time now to watch a short video of, um, of uh, Bishop Baron. Bishop Baron, who discusses uh, the dimension of um, the transcendent third. Please. Greek philosopher Aristotle spoke of the transcendent third by which he meant that a friendship such as the friendship that is supposed to exist between husband and wife, a friendship will endure, listen, 
only to the extent that the two friends fall in love, not so much with each other, but together fall in love with a transcended third. Husband is one, wife is two, there is a third. And that third is transcendent, meaning transcends the two of them. It's above the two of them. <clears throat> Marital relationship or any kind of serious friendship will only endure and last and be peaceful and be pleasant to the extent that the two people not only fall in love with one another, but that the two of them together fall in love with a transcended third. With some good, with some good, we call God is good, right? With some good, with some truth, God is truth. With some beauty, God is beautiful. The true, the beautiful, and the good. To the extent that the two of them fall in love with a higher power that is good, that is beautiful, that is true, that is beyond them. If you think that it is your, the power of your love for your wife, for the person you want to marry, or the power of your husband for the person you want to marry that will carry you, you will be humiliated, you will be disgraced. Because you are a fallen human being, your love that is not that powerful as to carry you through. When Ephesians chapter 5, I have explained, says, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, that is what it means. Christ is the third, the transcendent third. Subject yourself to one another in reverence for the one that is beyond. Two friends, for example, who together love their country, who together love truth, who together love beauty, who together love music, who together love art, nature, books, their love is strengthened, not so much by the love they have for one another, but by the love they have together have for these other values. They move out of what could be called shared egotism, which is the life many people are living. I'm, I'm egotistic, you are egotistic. So we are in the same room. We only have shared egotism. They move out of that. This shared egotism is what friendship will develop into unless there is some transcendent third good which pulls the friends outside of themselves. Human beings tend to be within ourselves, tend to be selfish, self-centered, egotistic. It is only when there is a third force that pulls us beyond ourselves that we go beyond ourselves. The irony is that it is the third, the transcendent third kind of friendship that can last. On the other hand, if it is only the two friends who fall in love with each other, without a transcendent third, in time, that relationship begins to fail. When we say in the Gloria, during Mass, the Gloria, glory to, the, to God in the highest and peace to people on earth, that is a formula for joy, for peace, for success, and for fulfillment among men and women. When God is giving glory, what happens to human beings? They enjoy peace. When the angel sang during the night Jesus was born, he said what? Glory to God in the highest and peace. It is only when you give glory to God in the highest that you can have any measure of peace in the world. It is only when God is giving glory up that any human relationship can have peace. Reason is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When together we fall in love with the transcendent good, namely the good of God, then we tend to have peaceful relationships. The trouble is that if we are simply to establish relationships among ourselves out of our own human resources only, then they will tend to degenerate into division, bickering, competition, and warfare. Yes, glory to God in the highest. And only then do men and women have peace. To be married in church is to say we, the man and his wife, we discern that together we are in love with God. We discern that God for his kind purposes has drawn us together. That's what we are saying to be married in church. It is not just the two of us being in love or liking each other. It is that God has for his purposes drawn us together so that we might find our salvation 
in each other's presence and that together we might fulfill a common mission. This is the marital vocation. That's why we call it a vocation. When you have discerned, then you are ready to stand at the altar before God. That is falling in love with the transcendent Todd. This is why Fulton Shin wrote a book titled Three to Get Married. You can Google it. Fulton Shin's book about marriage says three to get married. Husband, wife, and the transcendent Todd. It is not just two, husband and wife. Together, we fall in love with God. Together, we surrender to God's purpose. Now, we are ready for Christian marriage. It is only then people are ready for Christian marriage. I mean, just from this short thing about the helplessness of godlessness, you can now understand what I mean when I say the reason why many people are not prepared for Christian marriage is that they have not committed themselves to God in the first place. We shall walk a much happier path if we keep this principle of the God factor, the transcendent third. Be committed to God's purpose and then, wait a minute, be committed to God's purpose and then find somebody who is as in love with that third force as yourself. That's the only way you can have a peaceful Christian marriage. You are committed with God. Then look for somebody who is as passionate, who is as committed to that third force. Then you can have a chance of having a successful marriage. That's the transcendent third. Next is the plague of materialism and the idolatry of pleasure. And they are linked. When human beings are alienated from God, when human beings no longer find their source of meaning and purpose in God, when human beings are cut off from closeness to God, what do they do? They say a sinking man grabs any straw. What they do is that they hold on to the body. That's why you are seeing that the godless world, the godless world today is, is beginning to be very innovative about the body. Very creative about sexual and sensual pleasures. And recently I sent out an article that I, that I titled The, God, the, 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 the uh, Restlessness of Godlessness. And I talked about the fact that because people can no longer find their fulfillment in God, you are a man today. And after a few years, uh, uh, Dr. Julius uh, Bala, who has, who has adult children, will now tell Madame that, you know, I made a mistake, really. My real self is that I am a woman. God forbid. I mean. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of nonsense are coming. Because when God created us and our bodies, if you are no longer connected to God, do you think we will know how to use our bodies? Absolutely not. Materialism. Just grabbing, 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 grabbing. Which is, and you can see that as the grab, grab mentality is increasing in Nigeria, divorce rate is increasing, right? Marital dysfunction is increasing. Idolatry of pleasure. Pleasure itself can become a God, and it is becoming a God in the life of many people. Yeah, I have my own life to live. I have my pleasures. The person who is hooked to pleasure has no sense of sacrifice, cannot make any sacrifice. And marriage is about sacrifice. And I hope you know, I, I saw some of it in the women report and some of the men report too. I hope you know that materialism is responsible for a lot of marital breakdowns. Materialism. Uh, and, 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 and I'm going to, and I hope it comes out a little in, uh, in, in the uh, presentations of uh, um, Dr. Bala and, and, and others that if husband and wife do not trust themselves with money, that relationship is, if it doesn't break down, it will be dysfunctional. I have every reason to say that if it is out of all of you here, if it is only two couples that are having joint accounts, or whose wife knows exactly what the man makes and whose husband knows exactly what the woman makes, then it means those are the only people who are truly Christian couples. Fina trust in finances, trust in financial whatever is a fundamental ingredient of a stable marriage. You don't trust yourselves. If your marriage has not collapsed, it is on the way. 
Next is poor spiritual and psychological preparation. Many adults are neither psychologically nor spiritually equipped to undertake the serious business of Christian marriage. Marriage is serious business. And there are many layabouts that are getting into marriage. There are many people who are neither emotionally mature, neither psychologically developed, nor spiritually aware who are going into marriage. So from the beginning, the marriage is crashing. From the very beginning, actually a lot of, a lot of marriages that we see are just hanging in there. The marriages have, very, have no psychological foundation, no spiritual foundation. I have seen too much of that in my life as a priest. And I have, that's why some of you here have been hearing me say that 75% of people going into marriages should not go into marriage should they know what marriage is all about. And Innocent is here. He knows that when, when in Asokuro we set up the premarital course and we, we, we had a group, I think it was 2011, we had a group and we were working on it halfway through the course. When we try to make them know the, the importance of the course, Dr. Julius Bala was part of it, Innocent was part of it, I know that. By halfway through the course, three of the couples came and said, if that is how marriage is, as you have explained, I don't, we don't think we are for each other. And my problem is that such preparation is not happening. Even in this place, in Luxera, we had a set that I was doing premarital course for. And halfway through it, one couple came to me and said, if that is how it is, uh, where's Mrs. Mwachuku? You know about it. Halfway through it, one couple came to me and said, if this is how it is, I don't think we are for each other. So, when, and I keep, say, I keep saying to my colleagues, don't make premarital calls the next day before, before wedding. Don't make premarital calls when they have done traditional wedding. Don't make premarital calls when they have, make premarital calls one, two years before. When no serious commitment has already been made. But when people come with three months pregnancy to say they are doing premarital course, they are not listening to you. They are just following the requirements. So many people, are, they, many, many people have no, they are not equipped for any permanent commitment to sacrificial love. No way. Number five. Success in marital relationships is an enormous task. A task. Uh, marriage is not sugar in the morning and sugar in the evening only. It's a task. I mean, young people have sexual uh, attraction, which is called infatuation, and they come and say that they are in love. And I say, if, which young man sees a young woman and is not attracted? What achievement, what achievement have you made to see for a, a young man to see a young woman and say that I am in love with her? Am I to congratulate you? It's instinctual now. Even an, a lower animal sees a, 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 a male or female, they get attracted. So you have not done anything. It's instinctual. But real marriage is a task. But many lack the required skills. I put in capital letter. Skills. Many lack the required skills. The interpersonal skills. The communication skills. The negotiation skills to execute this task. Every day, the people who live together, they need to be negotiating, isn't it? Negotiating how the house will be taken care of. Negotiating how the children are to be brought up. Negotiating how finances are to be managed. And in this process of communication, with a lot of conversation rather than argument, conversation, many people do not have the skills. And these are skills that people should go to school to learn. I spent a long time learning, for example, communication, which I, uh, communication for counseling, which I teach. But it's, it's a course, and it takes time. In our environment, we, we have not been taught how to listen, I hope you know. Not to talk of man listening to his wife. In our environment, we have not been taught. The, 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 many, the few men who know how to listen to their wives is personal effort, not because the environment has taught them. It's personal effort, or maybe their own father had a good example for them. Otherwise, many, many of us don't know how to listen. What we have are um, mutual, I mean, people, you are talking, and another person is talking, 
two monologues going on at the same time, not dialogue. We are very good at that, two monologues. I'm talking, as he is talking, I'm waiting for where he will make a mistake for me to point out. I am not listening to him. There is what they call listening skills. And listening skills involve empathic listening. To listen in order to feel what the person is feeling when he's saying what he's saying. We don't know what is called empathic feeling, empathic listening. It is a course that we must attend and know if we want to run a marital relationship. Then, negotiation, like I said, every day in marriage, negotiation is going on. It's a continuous thing. So you need skills for negotiation. We need skills. You need to know how to put your points across. And you need, for example, to show that you are listening to somebody. You know what they call feedback. To show, because communication is not that I have said it to me, I have told you. It is you are talking and you want to make sure that the person you are talking to understands you and the feelings that you want to communicate. So when the person finishes speaking, before you respond, you say, did I hear you say this? Is this what I'm hearing you say? You paraphrase what the person has said and ask if that is exactly what the person means before you respond. Do you understand? The person has to agree that that is what I mean before you respond. But what often happens? Before the person even finishes what he's saying, we have responded. And then, of course, conflict. Six, primitive, unsustainable, unchristian beliefs, practices, and paradigms regarding marital relationships. You know all this. Some of it came out in the reports. Primitive. Many men here were a bit offended when somebody said it too bluntly. I think sometimes if you want to communicate, you must, you must lower it down the way you say it. When she said, somebody said here that today we have 18th century men marrying 21st century women. And the men here nearly ate her all. But I won't say it that way. But there is a point in it. Many men, including some here, want to relate with their wives the same way their fathers related with their, their mothers. And the same way their grandfather related with their grandmothers. It's not possible. Your grandfather or your father might have been somebody who went to the, 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 the Second World War and went to school and had a whatever and married a girl who was 10, 15 years younger than him who didn't go to school. A girl who calls him Oga. Are we not familiar with that? So your grandfather or your father married a girl who calls him Oga. And who, if you are Yoruba, who kneels down when Oga is drinking uh, water. And that is the scenario of the home you came out of. Then you met a girl in the university. Your girl, your, the, 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 she was studying accountancy and you were studying economics. And you loved her intelligence. You were attracted by her what? Intelligence. Then you say you want to marry her. When she reaches home, you say, this is not how my father and my mother, this is how they will relate. It won't happen. That's what Chichi meant by 18th century men marrying 21st century woman. It's not possible. The world has changed. And women, all of us must agree, agree to the minimum that for millennia, we have put women down. But that in recent times, women have gone to school. Women are getting jobs. Women, we, women are waking up to their fundamental rights. And you think that you can put them down. If you really, and I have constantly told people, if you really want to relate with a woman the way your grandfather related with the wife, then marry one of those granite sellers at the junction. You are a PhD holder. Marry one granite seller whom you can sleep with. Then if you say jump, she will say, how high should I jump? <laughs> but if you marry a graduate like yourself, I mean, a, 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 girl, a girl said to her father, she was what, 15 or 16? She had just finished secondary school. No, she was already in the university. And then when she was arguing with her father, she said, are you talking to me like that? 
You mean, you're talking to me like that. The girl said, Daddy, you sent me to school. You paid a lot of money to make me what I am today. I read, I'm reading logic in the university. You are not, your logic is not correct, Daddy. So, Daddy, you paid for me to be able to argue with you. So, there are consequences. If you choose to marry somebody of your level, of your educational level, please know that there are consequences. If it is a house girl you can sleep with that you want, there are, I can recommend some granite sellers nearby for you. Then, no problem. When you say sit down here till I come, as I'm going to walk, sit down here till I come, don't get up. Oh. You may sit down there. But I can bet you that even the granite seller. <laughs> I don't know. I, I want to quickly finish. I don't know how many of you are familiar. Please Google it. Nigerian men in the USA killing their imported wives from Nigeria. Nigerian men in the USA killing their... You know what happened? Chimamanda wrote about it. Af Am Americana, right? One of Chimamanda, Americana. Nigerian men live here to the US. When they see the sense of right, fundamental right of women in America, they decide to come to the village to marry a wife. Right? After marrying a wife from the village, they reach the US, the easiest thing is to go and read nursing. Once the lady, as she's reading nursing, she's mixing with other women. Uh -huh. Once she finishes, you say, I say, sit down there. He said, listen, if you raise your voice again, I'll call police. <laughs> and this man is totally flabbergasted because, eh? This person I went to the village to, eh? I say, if you raise your voice again, I will dial 911. All of a sudden, he discovers that the native wife, <laughs> the native wife he was looking for, within six months, one year, is now behaving like an American lady. That's what Chimamanda dealt with in that novel. And that is a man who has refused to wake up to the new reality. Lack of communication, or of commitment to lasting Christian union has been mentioned. And I said it before, if you are not all in, you are not married. If you leave the door open, if you leave the back door open, you are going to use it. Finally, before I leave here, healthy marital relationships is the result of hard work. One, adequate preparation, spiritual, psychological, and social. Adequate preparation. We can spend days in discussing what that involves. I am saying that I am not convinced that 75% of people going to marriage are adequately prepared. I'm not convinced. Two, and let it be known that our church recommends, the standard of our church is six months before marriage preparation should begin. It is true that in this country, premarital course is three months. But you need a six-month period. Don't go to a priest. When your wife is uh, three months pregnant and you have fixed traditional wedding failed to go to a priest to say you want to wed. That has already failed from the beginning. Then, clear, psychological and emotional preparations, we need a lot of it. And it is because I have seen this. It's part of the motivation for my setting up what I call the Psycho-Spiritual Institute. We are training people in Nairobi. If God blesses us in a few years, we may begin to have a campus here to train people. The two priests working in Gadium Espes were trained at our institute in Nairobi. We have trained over 35 priests and sisters and a few lay people. And it is so that they can be equipped to, to help counsel people. A lot of people are emotionally and psychologically immature. Like somebody said, they are like babies in big bodies. Babies in big bodies, men and women. Next, commitment to love as a decision, not a feeling. If marriage is going to succeed, people must be committed to love as a decision. Can we say that together? Love as a decision and not a... Next is that daily nurturing of friendship and intimacy. The daily nurturing of friendship and intimacy requires 
ongoing mutual appreciation. You must be appreciating yourself every day if that friendship is going to last. Daily admiration and celebration. Oh, that was very good. That, that food, oh, wonderful. You know, even for small, small things, to show appreciation is part of what, <clears throat> there is a baby in each human being that wants to be petted, right? That wants to be congratulated. There's a baby in each person, even the bigger, who is the tallest man here? Uh -huh. There's a baby inside. And that baby wants to be appreciated and celebrated and admired and so on. If you don't do that for your, the person you call your best friend or your wife or your husband, then that, that friendship is going down. Ongoing mutual understanding and mutual forgiveness. Understanding one another. Look, it's easier to understand the, the, what the shuttle going to the moon. The, that complicated machine going to the moon is easier to understand it than a human being. As we sit down, so after many years, Azubike and Ifoma, it is easier to understand the space shuttle than to understand one another. It's not easy. We are complicated. So you need to spend time. Spend time. And part of it is asking questions. Ask questions. Please, ask more questions than make statements. It is statements that hurt. Questions don't hurt. Ask more questions. Did I hear you say this? Oh, did you say this? Uh, uh, is it possible to spend more time at home? Can you, think, can you plan your work in such a way that you spend more time at home? Instead of, look at home, who doesn't hardly we, we hardly see you at home. What kind of husband are you? Oh, what does that lead to? Conflict. But the same feeling you have, is it possible to organize yourself to spend more time at home? Has it not still communicated the same thing? So generally, ask questions rather than make statements. I refer you to uh, Pope Francis' um, three, three expressions. May I? I am sorry. Thank you. Then please, let us learn to accept influence. To accept the influence of our partners. Accept the influence of your partner. It is easier in a male chauvinist society for the woman to accept the influence of the wife. But men need to learn in our society how to accept influence from the woman. For example, you have an idea you are discussing and your wife brings up something that is a suggestion that is good. Celebrate it. You say, ah, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful. No human being wants to be seen as if she's only on the receiving side. She doesn't have anything to contribute. No human being. And even our fathers, our mothers, and so on and so forth, they may have accepted it, but I don't think they like it. I will stop here, and I will just end by saying, sisters and brothers, Christians, all of us, whether you are married or not, you have people who are married around you. We all have work to do. We have work to do. May the Lord enlighten us so that we may be agents to help the relationships around us. Amen.